Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Book of Revelation. This is lesson number 16, and we're dealing with chapter 11. If you want to keep up with this series, be sure to click on that subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen at any time during this video. As we open chapter 11, remember that we are still in the interlude between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. The first 14 verses of chapter 11 are part of that interlude that began in chapter 10. Therefore, what we saw in chapter 10 regarding the little scroll or the little book that John was told to eat and that it would be as sweet as honey in his mouth but bitter in his stomach will flow together with the symbolism that is in the first 14 verses. So let me remind you of that little book that was sweet and bitter that it was the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ, and that it was sweet to those who accept it, but often bitter to those who proclaim it. Therefore, chapter 11 continues with the theme of both the message of the gospel, as well as those who accept and proclaim it. And it does so by beginning with a biblical symbol of protection. Chapter 11 starts with John stating that he was given a measuring rod and told to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Measuring in the Bible denotes that of both conquering and protecting, and we can find examples of that in Ezekiel chapter 48 verse 18, as well as 2 Kings 21 verse 13. In this case, it would be that of protection, because Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 speaks of God nourishing his church for this same time period that we will be examining here in a moment. In Revelation 11 verse 2, John is told not to measure the outer court because it has been given over to the Gentiles to be tread underfoot for 42 months. At this point, we need to consider another symbol and examine it. And so keep in mind, as we noted before, that numbers in the book of Revelation are to be understood in terms of quality rather than quantity. Scholars have noted that 42 months is the same as 1260 days and that both of these are also equal to that of three and a half years. Therefore, each time that we read in Scripture about 42 months or 1260 days or three and a half years, they are all referring to this same prophetic time period. Different churches have different opinions as to what this time period is, and some churches even have a couple of different interpretations of this time period. For example, some say that the three and a half years refers to that of Stephen being stoned after the crucifixion of Christ. Now, that is assuming, of course, that it was indeed three and a half years after the crucifixion, though there is nothing in the Bible to confirm that. And they also teach that the 42 months, or the 1260 days, three and a half years, refers to a time period spanning between 538 A.D. and 1798 A.D. Now, for a church to hold two different interpretations of the very same time period is problematic. Each time that one of these symbols are used, 42, 1260, or three and a half, is always referring to the same period, not two different time periods. Sometimes it's helpful to return to the first time it is used in Scripture to discover the key to unlocking the meaning. It's like the key at the front door. Daniel chapter 7 verses 25 through 27 is the first time that this symbol is used. Here is what it says in part. He, referring to the fourth beast of the book of Daniel, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, then the saints shall be given over into his hands for a time and times and half a time. That is, a time, which would be one year, times would be two years, and a half a time would be half a year, so equaling that of three and a half years. Notice verse 26. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, and consume and destroy it forever. When does that happen? Well, clearly that's at the second coming, because that's when things will be consumed by fire and destroyed forever. But listen to verse 27 that really cinches it. Then, referring to the end of the 1260 days, or the time, time and half a times, three and a half years, 42 months, 
Then the kingdom and dominion shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. There is no getting around what is being said here. Daniel is clearly stating that at the end of the time, time and half a times, three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, that it ends with the second coming. Now, for the sake of time, we'll come back to this prophetic time period later because Revelation chapter 11 isn't the last time that it's mentioned. But let's go to the next point in Revelation chapter 11 verse 3. Here John records God saying that he would give power to his two witnesses for how long? For 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Here is that time period mentioned again. But let's stay with the two witnesses for a while and come back to the prophetic time period later. Who are these two witnesses? First, Notice that verse 4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. This is a direct reference to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah 4 verse 14 is similar to verse 4 of chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. These are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. Revelation chapter 11 verse 6 gives us another clue as to who they are. Notice what it says. These have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Who does that remind you of? Elijah, of course. Verse 6 continues. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. And who does that sound like? Moses. And remember this, when Jesus went up on the mountain to pray and was transfigured before the eyes of Peter, James, and John in Mark chapter 9, who did the disciples see standing beside Jesus, the Lord of all the earth? It was Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are referred to in the Bible as the law and the prophets. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. Now let's bring this symbol full circle to that of the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ, which is symbolized in the little scroll and the little book that we saw in chapter 10. And notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, because there Paul was referring to our righteousness that is not found in our keeping of the law, but is found in our acceptance of Jesus' death in our behalf. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being, listen, witnessed by the law and the prophet. There are the two witnesses. It is being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, even in the Old Testament, salvation is by grace in Christ Jesus. And the words of Moses and Elijah and all of the prophets were about Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus scolds the religious leaders of his day, saying, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is they that testify of me. The word testify is witness. For it is they who witness of me. After Jesus died and rose again, he met with two on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. There on that road, to two unnamed followers referred to as disciples, Jesus shared the gospel of grace, the story of his sacrifice from the Old Testament. Verses 7 through 10 of Revelation chapter 11 now tells us how these symbolic witnesses that represent the good news of grace are killed and how their death is celebrated. That that again returns to the bitterness that comes to those who proclaim the gospel of grace. And by the way, this is not just referring to hedonistic people who are against any reference to a God that they must answer to. This also refers to those who are very religious, just like the religious people in Jesus' day. 
who didn't like it that everyone had access to God, even those whom the religious people seemed to marginalize. In verses 11 through 14 of Revelation chapter 11, these symbolic witnesses that represent salvation by grace are resurrected from the dead. And verse 11 says, And great fear fell upon those who saw them. Verses 12 and 13 then sound very much like chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, where the wicked are crying for the rocks to fall on them at Christ's return, because it also speaks of a great earthquake that seems to happen right at the second coming of Christ. And then verses 15 through 19 of Revelation chapter 11, you find the seventh trumpet. Finally, the interlude is finished. We are coming to the seventh trumpet, and it seems to me that this trumpet is sounding as we, the saints, are entering through the pearly gates, because verse 19 says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple, and there was lightning and noise and thundering and earthquake and great hail. That sounds like a fireworks show unlike any that we have ever seen. So let me summarize this with a modern-day parable or a symbolic example. Do you have a favorite movie? Well, one that you like to watch maybe every year? My favorite is It's a Wonderful Life. And if you are familiar with that movie, you know that Jimmy Stewart is the main character. Now imagine that you rent a copy of the movie and you want to share it with a good friend, and you put in the movie, and Stuart is very skillfully cut out of most of the movie. He has a few parts. You might see him say, you, 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 you want the moon, Mary? J just, just tell me, and I'll throw a rope around it and pull it down to you. Or you might, you might see the part where he says to the officer, my lips bleeding, Bert. My lips bleeding. I, I love that movie. But suppose that you're watching the movie with someone who has never seen it before, and even without Jimmy's presence in most of the movie, your friend loves the movie. He or she is drawn to Mary that is played by Donna Reed, or, or the children, or, or maybe they become fearful of Mr. Potter that is played by Lionel Barrymore. And he is skillfully made out to be the main character. But you, you knowing that the main character was left out, at least to the most part, you persist that you want them to watch the movie with Jimmy Stewart in it and all of his parts and his scenes. Wouldn't you expect them to like the movie much better when the main character is not left out? I would. However, they may have been so captivated by what they saw in that skillfully edited movie that the main character being changed now to Jimmy Stewart spoiled what they had become attached to, and they didn't like it. That would be really tragic, wouldn't it? But that isn't probably how it would go. It would probably be more like this. You tell your friend that you want them to watch your favorite movie with you, and you put the movie in, and you realize that most of Jimmy Stewart's parts have been cut out, and your friend gets bored early in the movie, and they walk away from it. They see it as confusing and boring. You assure them that there is a better version, and you will get it for them to watch from the video store next week. Unfortunately, they never seem to find time to sit down and try to follow along with some old black and white movie where the characters have all been dead for years. Sadly, they never get to enjoy It's a Wonderful Life. Sadly, that is what has happened regarding the Old Testament. The law and the prophets, the main character, Jesus Christ, salvation by his atoning sacrificial blood was often skillfully edited out. The main characters were Mr. and Mrs. Lawful. Sadly, that is what has happened to most of the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation. Uh, the main character, Jesus Christ, is mentioned a few times from the pulpit, but most of the time, things are all, as they say, discombobulated. Here a little, and there a little, and line upon line. Before long, people find it confusing and boring. But for those who get to see the little scroll, the little book, with the main character full of color, and it is as sweet as honey in their mouth. I hope these lessons from the book of Revelation show you the main character, Jesus Christ, in a way that keeps you looking for the next episode in the series.
But if you find that the story with the main character, Jesus Christ, forces you to change your mind on what you have gotten in previous viewings, I hope that it doesn't make you bitter. If this video has been helpful to you, click on that like button, give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and choose all so that you can be sure to get a notification the next time a video comes up. God bless, and I'll see you in the next video.